Welcome to our third module where you'll be learning about infancy and toddlerhood. I've divided this module into three videos. The first one is on physical development in infancy and toddlerhood. And the second video, you'll be learning about cognitive development during this stage. And then in the third video, you're going to be learning about psychosocial development. So let's get started. So in our module, you're going to be learning about physical development. You'll learn about things like growth and reflexes, sleep and nutrition. You'll also be learning about cognitive development. In other words, how does thinking change during this stage? You'll learn about Piaget's theory of cognitive development. And you'll also be learning about memory and language. And then you're going to be learning about psychosocial development. And you'll learn about Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. And you'll also look at temperament and personality. You'll look at things that affect attachment. You'll look at what attachment is and different ways for us to examine or understand attachment and how it affects us short term and long term. And you'll also be learning about self awareness. By the time you finish this chapter, you should be able to summarize overall physical growth during infancy. You should also be able to describe the growth of the brain during infancy and explain infant sleep. You should also be able to identify newborn reflexes and describe them. You should also be able to compare gross and fine motor skills and contrast the development of the senses in newborns. You should be able to describe the habituation procedure and explain the merits of breastfeeding and when to introduce more solid foods. You should also be able to discuss the nutritional concerns of Merasmus and Kwashiorkor. Growth is more rapid in infancy than during any other period after birth. Typically, infants double their birth weight by four months of age and triple their birth weight by the first year. The rate of growth is so rapid, if it continued throughout childhood, a typical 10-year-old boy would be nearly as long as a jumbo jet and weigh almost as much. Right after birth, babies lose 5% of their weight. In addition, we start to see a change in proportions. At birth, the head is 25% of our length, whereas by adulthood, it's 20% of our length. So infants are not simply scaled down versions of adults. Compared with adolescents and adults, infants and young children look top heavy because their heads and trunks are disproportionately large. As growth of the hips, legs, and feet catches up later in childhood, their bodies take on more adult proportions. Here in figure 3-1, you can see an image that shows you the changes in proportions that people experience throughout their lives from infancy on into adulthood. The physical changes that we see as infants grow are very impressive. Even more awe-inspiring are changes involving the brain and the nervous system. Infants' feelings of hunger or pain, their smiles or laughs, and their efforts to sit upright or to hold a rattle all reflect the functioning of the brain and the rest of the emerging nervous system. So how does the brain accomplish these many tasks? To answer this question, we need to look at the organization of the brain. The basic unit in the brain and the rest of the nervous system is the neuron, a cell specialized for receiving and transmitting information. Neurons have basic elements that we're going to look at now. First, the cell body. The cell body is in the center of the cell and it contains the biological machinery that keeps the neuron alive. The receiving end of the neuron is the dendrite, and it receives inputs from thousands of other neurons. The tube-like structure that emerges from the other side of the cell body is the axon. The axon transmits information to other neurons. At the end of the axon are small knobs that are called terminal buttons. And these terminal buttons release chemicals that are known as neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are messengers that carry information to nearby neurons. Neurons never touch. Instead, they communicate via these neurotransmitters. Another important term for you to know is the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath surrounds the axon, and the myelin sheath serves the important function of insulating the axon. It also is important in helping to speed up the neural impulse. Here's figure 3-2, 
where you'll see the components of the neuron. The first thing you'll see on the left-hand side is the cell body, and then you'll see the dendrites. And remember, the dendrites receive messages from other cells. And then we have the axon. The axon is what gives the neuron its length, and it's covered by the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath helps to speed up the impulse and it insulates the axon. You'll also notice the terminal buttons and the terminal buttons release neurotransmitters. And remember, neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that facilitate the transmission of information from one neuron to the next. And also remember that neurons never touch because of that communication, they don't need to. They rely on neurotransmitters. Let's take a look at some of the changes that happen in neurons in infancy. The first thing that we see happening is synaptogenesis. And synaptogenesis is the formation of synapses between neurons in the nervous system. And even though this occurs throughout a healthy person's lifespan, there's an explosion of synapse formation that occurs in early brain development. Another important term is synaptic blooming, and this is a period of rapid neural growth. And this is followed by synaptic pruning. So after the period of rapid growth in synapses, the brain starts to remove synapses that it no longer needs. So once the brain forms a synapse, it can either be strengthened or weakened. And this depends on how often the synapse is used. In other words, this process follows the use it or lose it principle. Synapses that are more active are strengthened and synapses that are less active are weakened and ultimately pruned. The process of removing these irrelevant synapses during this time is what is referred to as synaptic pruning. Babies are born with relatively few myelinated axons. That's one reason that infants can't see well and can't do much with their hands other than grasping and batting at objects. As children get older, different areas of the brain become myelinated on a genetically determined timetable. And these periods of myelination are critical periods for learning. About 50 billion to 100 billion neurons make up an adult's brain. The wrinkled surface of the brain is the cerebral cortex, and it's made up of 10 billion neurons. The cortex regulates many functions that we consider human. It consists of left and right halves that are called hemispheres which are linked by a thick bundle of neurons that are called the corpus callosum. The characters you value the most, for example, your personality, your way with words, or your knack for reading others' emotions, are all controlled by specific regions of the cortex. For example, your personality and your ability to make and carry out plans are largely centered in an area of the front of the cortex called the frontal lobe. And so this part of the brain is important in thinking, planning, memory, and judgment. Each of these hemispheres is divided into four lobes. So in addition to the frontal lobe, we have the parietal lobe, which is important in processing information about touch, the occipital lobe, which is important in processing visual information, and then the temporal lobe, which is important in processing auditory information and language. When thinking about the frontal lobe and specifically the prefrontal cortex, its development is uniquely important during infancy, and it has important implications for how children's early environments shape the development of frontal circuits important for complex cognitive skills. Animal models and human studies suggest that the development of the frontal lobe structure, function, and behaviors are permanently shaped by and may be uniquely susceptible to early adverse experiences. So fortunately, there's growing awareness across the scientific community, government organizations, private organizations, and corporations, and the general public, that children are not just resilient, that adverse early experiences can lead to a myriad of harmful outcomes at both the individual and societal level. One thing we'll be looking at later in the semester is what is known as adverse childhood experiences. And this particular, there was a study that was done and it was instrumental in demonstrating the importance of early experiences for health related outcomes in adulthood. During infancy, we see lateralization. 
And this is where different functions of the brain become localized primarily on one side of the brain or the other. We also see neuroplasticity. This is the brain's ability to change both physically and chemically in response to environmental stimulation, hormonal processes, and medications. Neuroplasticity enhances the brain's adaptability to environmental change and helps the infant to compensate for injury. The younger that a person is, the greater the level of neuroplasticity. While adults exhibit neuroplasticity, it's not to the degree that we see in early childhood and infancy. The sleep needs for babies vary depending on their age. Newborns do sleep much of the time, but their sleep is in very short segments. As the baby grows, the total amount of sleep slowly decreases, but the length of nighttime sleep increases. So generally, newborns sleep about eight to nine hours in the daytime and about eight hours at night. And there is, of course, some variation. But they might not sleep more than an hour or two at a time. Most babies don't start sleeping through the night, meaning about six to eight hours, without waking until they're about three months old or until they weigh about 12 to 13 pounds. And about two thirds of babies are able to sleep through the night on a regular basis by about six months. You also notice here some important terms. One is polyphasic, and this means that there are several sleep periods throughout the day. You'll also notice here that infants or newborns spend about 50% of their sleep time in REM. So when parents watch their baby sleep, they might be wondering, is their baby dreaming? Well, while we, while we may not know what they're dreaming about, the answer is of course, yes. In fact, their baby is dreaming a lot more in the first few months of life than they ever will at any other time. So REM stands for rapid eye movement, and it's called this because their eyes move quickly in different directions during the sleep phase. And this is due to activity in the brain, which is how dreams happen. So dreams can also happen in other phases of sleep, but they're most vivid in REM. The time spent in sleep and in REM decreases with age. REM is very important for everyone to get, but it's especially important for babies. It might not sound very restful, but it's incredibly important. Some of the benefits include learning and memory. So studies have shown that humans have trouble retaining information in their short and their long-term memory without the support of REM. So as babies learn throughout the day, which they learn more than anyone does, think about all of the experiences that they have and how new they are to them. It's important as they learn for them to experience REM so that their brain has time to process it all. Another important element of REM is brain development. So neural connections are incredibly important for a baby's development. And research suggests that REM sleep is when neural connections go into overdrive, meaning that REM promotes development. There's also believed to be a link between REM sleep and coping mechanisms. So another important reason for REM sleep is mood. So coping skills are particularly important to a baby for them to have healthy development. And this will help them in everything from communication development to executive functioning. And by executive functioning, we're talking about the ability to self-regulate and to use memory and other higher level functions. Sudden infant death syndrome, also known as SIDS, is the sudden unexplained death of an infant who's younger than one year of age. It's the leading cause of death in children between one month and one year of age. Most SIDS deaths occur when babies are between one month and four months old. So the causes of SIDS isn't fully understood, but there are steps that parents can take to reduce the risk. One very important step that can be taken is for parents to place their baby on their back when they go to sleep, even for short naps. It's important for babies to get tummy time, but that's for when babies are awake and someone's watching. In addition, it's important for babies to sleep on a firm surface, like a crib mattress 
covered with a fitted sheet. It's also important that soft objects and loose bed bedding are kept away from the baby's sleep area. Breastfeeding seems to also reduce the risk of SIDS. Also, it's important to make sure that babies don't get too hot and parents should keep the room at a comfortable temperature. What would be comfortable for an adult? It's also important that parents make sure that uh, there is no one who smokes near the baby and that mothers are not smoking during pregnancy. In the 1990s, there was a campaign called Back to Sleep and it still has continued. And in this campaign, nurses and doctors strongly encouraged parents to have their babies sleep on their backs. Years ago, people used to think that it was best to have babies sleep on their stomachs, that they would sleep better. And even if a baby might sleep better, it's tremendously safer for them to sleep on their backs. It's extremely important that parents do that. You can take a look at figure 3-6 in your textbook, and you can see how sudden infant death syndrome has declined over the years. And this is very attributable to the back to sleep campaign and the education that nurses and doctors have provided to parents. Newborns are well prepared to interact with their world because they're born with a rich set of reflexes. Reflexes are unlearned or involuntary responses that are triggered by a specific form of stimulation. Some reflexes help newborns get the nutrients that they need to grow. For example, the rooting reflex and the sucking reflex both ensure that the newborn can begin a new diet of life-sustaining milk. Other reflexes protect the newborn from danger in its environment. For example, the eye blink helps newborns avoid unpleasant stimulation. And other reflexes are the foundation for larger voluntary patterns of motor activity. For example, the stepping reflex is a precursor to walking. Reflexes also help reveal whether the newborn's nervous system is working properly. So for example, infants with damage to the sciatic nerve don't show the withdrawal reflex. In the same vein, uh, many reflexes normally vanish during infancy. If they linger, this suggests a problem in the developing nervous system. During infancy, babies progress from reflexes to voluntary movement. We have what's called the sepulocaudal pattern, and this is exemplified by a gain in head control before the ability to walk. We also have the proximodistal pattern, and this is exemplified by an infant grasping with their whole hand first and then their fingers later. With each of these, we see an average age as well as a range of typical ages. So for example, the average age of sitting is seven months with a range of anywhere typically between five and nine months of age. A major accomplishment of infancy is the skilled use of the hands. Newborns have little apparent control of their hands, but as they approach one year of age, they're extraordinarily talented. At about four months of age, infants successfully reach for objects. And these early reaches can look kind of clumsy because they don't move their arm and hand smoothly to the object. Instead, their hand moves a short distance. It then slows down and moves again in a slightly different direction. And then this is repeated until the hand finally contacts the object. As infants grow, their reaches have fewer movements but they're still not as continuous and smooth as reaches by older children and adults. Grasping is a type of fine motor skill and it poses a different challenge from reaching. Now, when, when infants are beginning to grasp, they have to coordinate movements of individual fingers to grab an object. So it becomes more efficient during infancy as they are practicing this and as their brain is developing. Most four-month-olds use their fingers to hold objects, but not until seven or eight months do we begin to see them positioning their hands to make it easier to grasp an object. If trying to grasp a long, thin rod, for example, they might place their fingers 
perpendicular to the rod, which is the best position for grasping. And then they reach more slowly for smaller objects that require more precise grip. So at four months of age, we see what's called the palmer grasp. And this is the use of fingers and the palm, but not the thumb to grasp objects. By around nine months, we see the pincher grasp. And this is the use of the thumb and the forefinger to grasp an object. In infancy, we see the use of gross motor skills. And this involves the use of large muscle groups that control our head, torso, arms, and legs. These are larger movements, and they're generally developed before fine motor skills. Some examples of gross motor skills include the baby eventually being able to lift their head up when on its stomach, the baby being able to move their head from side to side when lying on their back, and eventually the baby sitting with little support at the waist. At birth, an infant's vision isn't very well developed. They can only focus about eight to 16 inches from their face, and they only see black, white, and gray. As early as the first week, babies begin to respond to movement, and they begin to focus on faces. Soon after that, the baby will begin to smile as a parent or caregiver comes close. And this is an important sign that the baby sees and recognizes the caregiver. Over the next 10 to 12 weeks after birth, the parent will begin to notice the baby's following moving objects and recognizing things, especially toys and mobiles that have bold or geometric patterns. As their color vision begins to develop, babies see red first, and then they will see the full spectrum of colors by the time they reach five months of age. So when do babies begin to see clearly? Well, depth perception and eye-hand coordination begin to develop when infants reach approximately five months or six months, so around that point in time. From about four to six months, that's when babies begin to reach out and try to touch objects. And this is something that previously tended to only happen by chance. So you all have probably heard of the term 2020 vision, and this is typically thought of as normal visual acuity. By six months of age, a child's visual acuity is around 2100. So a child won't reach adult levels of visual acuity until they reach about age four or five. As you've read, there are multiple benefits to breastfeeding. Interestingly, there was a study that was published in January 2007 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And the article authors suggested that babies who were breastfed had significantly better vision as young children than babies who were fed formula. So um, because the scientists had previously thought that there was a chemical known as DHA, that was found in higher concentrations in breast milk than in formula. And this enhances the vision of developing children. What they did is they randomly added DHA to the formulas of some of the non-breastfed children. So as you might have heard, DHA, it's an omega-3 fatty acid. And um, some of you may know that it's added to many brands of infant formula. And these are marketed as being closer to breast milk. Some studies have suggested that children who consume formulas that are fortified with DHA have higher cognitive function than children who drink unfortified formula. Um, but these studies haven't compared DHA fortified formulas to breast milk itself. So going back to vision, what was very interesting was that breastfed children were significantly more likely to score higher on tests of depth perception than formula fed babies, and that there was no significant difference in depth perception between those who were fed formula and those who had received the DHA supplement and those who had not. I think it's important to keep in mind that many mothers want to breastfeed, and that's not always a possibility for mothers. And there are certainly many things that mothers can do to provide a very nutritious environment and nutrient rich environment or opportunities for their baby. But this is an interesting study that does show the benefits of breastfeeding when it comes to vision. Hearing is almost fully developed at birth. 
and it's present by the seventh month of prenatal development, please be sure to read about the cat in the hat study described in your book. In infancy, the baby has the ability to recognize familiar voices and sounds, and it can initially differentiate between many language sounds, but this ability disappears. The ability to experience touch and pain, just as you and I do, is fully developed at birth, and so too is smell and taste. As many of you may know, newborns do prefer sweet tastes, and they also recognize and prefer their mother's scent. Just like adults, infants prefer to pay attention to new and interesting things. If left in the same environment, over time they become accustomed to their surroundings and they pay less attention to them. This process is called habituation. Habituation can be a very useful way to test cognitive and perceptual processes. Please be sure to read the section in your book where this is described. This is also habituation predictive of later cognitive ability. So the speed or the efficiency with which infants show habituation, it's shown to predict behaviors like language acquisition and verbal and nonverbal intelligence. So we've described a variety of sensations or sensory capabilities that infants have. Please be sure to be aware of the concepts and terminology within each of these sections that involve vision, hearing, and touch and pain, and taste and smell. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that babies be exclusively breastfed for the first six months and that breastfeeding continue for at least 12 months and thereafter for as long as it's mutually desired. Again, as I've mentioned before, this is a personal choice for the mother to make. Uh, and it is something that while many mothers want to do this, they may not be able to. Sometimes this can be due to returning early to work and not being able to be with their baby or having a baby in the NICU. Uh, stress sometimes can make it difficult. Sometimes other issues that can be related to difficulty in latching or a painful latch. Uh, sometimes babies have what's called a tongue tie and this can be treated and reduce pain that mothers may experience, but there are many reasons that a mother may not be breastfeeding that have that are unrelated to whether or not she actually wants to and again this is a personal choice for the mother to make but it is important to be aware of all of the benefits that breast milk provides for babies and it is the ideal way to feed a baby it's truly no exaggeration to say that breast milk is nature's perfect food uh, breast milk is exquisitely tailored to meet the nutritional needs of a newborn baby and there are multiple advantage of being breastfed. So for example, uh, it is the best nourishment. Breast milk is designed for a new baby's brand new digestive system. The protein and fat in a mother's milk is easier for the baby to digest than cow's milk formula, and its micronutrients are easily absorbed. Breast milk also offers protection against infections. Every time that a baby nurses, they get a healthy dose of the mother's antibodies, which help boost their immunity against colds, ear infections, respiratory tract infections, and other common childhood illnesses. Especially during the first six months, the mother's antibody-rich milk also helps protect their baby from diseases that they haven't yet been immunized for, like, for example, uh, influenza and whooping cough. Breastfeeding is also um, thought to reduce the risk of SIDS. So it, uh, at least if, it, if the baby's breastfed for two months, it's, uh, it cuts the risk of SIDS by nearly 50%. And they're not really sure why this is, but it may be that breastfed babies rouse from sleep more easily. And it could be that they have added immune protections that might be playing a role. Breast milk is also easier on the baby's tummy and it because it goes down easier it stays down easier and newborns are much less likely to suffer who are being breastfed are much less likely to suffer for, from constipation or diarrhea compared to babies who drink formula breastfeeding also promotes a healthier weight and it really lets babies their appetite call the shots 
a breastfed baby is likely to stop feeling full. Um, they, let the, they let their mother know that they're no longer hungry. Whereas a bottle fed infant might be encouraged to continue until the bottle's empty. So what's interesting is that these, um, because they're able to better regulate what they're consuming in infancy, um, not only is this beneficial then, but these weight related benefits may be persisting for years. And then there was a major study that was done over 16 countries, and they found that babies who were exclusively bre breastfed for six months, that there was a, for those babies, there was a reduction in the risk of childhood obesity by nearly 25%. It's also thought that breastfeeding is um, very helpful to the brain. And many studies show a slight but statistically significant increase in the IQ of breastfed babies and larger brain size compared with those who are formula fed in children who are as old as 15. So why might this be? Uh, we've talked about some of the nutrition that breast milk offers. And so breast milk contains key nutrients for brain development. Um, there are some um, like cholesterol and omega-3 fatty acid, DHA, hormones like oxytocin, um, thyroxin, estrogen, and nerve growth, um, and epidural growth factors. In addition, breastfed babies get lots of skin-to-skin -skin contact with mom. Now, so too can bottle-fed babies, but this in turn, in terms of the brain boost that breastfeeding may be giving, this may be adding to the, um, to ca causing the infant to feel nurtured and safe, which promotes intellectual development. But again, of course, bottle feeding parents can tap into this benefit too by keeping close to the baby during feeding and doing skin to skin feeds as well. What's really interesting too is that breastfed babies tend to have more adventurous taste buds. So, um, it seems to be that because the breast milk takes on the flavor of whatever the mother's eating, it acclimates a baby early on to a world full of flavors. So researchers have actually found that nurse babies are less likely to be timid in their taste than their formula fed peers once they move on to solids. And this may be, you know, this sort of translates into a toddler who might be more inclined to prefer bold or unusual tastes over those that are bland. Of course, there are many benefits of breastfeeding to moms as well. Uh, breastfeeding helps to promote postpartum recovery. It's also very convenient. Uh, it's also a built-in bonding, but of course, uh, this, uh, this is something that mothers who bottle feed their babies can provide as well, but just in a different way also can provide potentially some possible health protections down the road for mothers, possibly slashing the future odds of developing chronic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, and um, potentially high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and heart disease. And um, it, in addition, mothers who breastfeed do have a longer period of time where they don't have their period following the birth of their child. Typically, mothers who breastfeed begin to ovulate about four to six months after giving birth. And for some women, their periods don't come back for much longer. Of course, mothers who are breastfeeding should not rely on this as a form of birth control. Um, unless you're hoping to get pregnant, make sure that you talk to, if you are breastfeeding, if a mother is breastfeeding, uh, that mother needs to talk with their OBGYN about birth control options. There have been multiple instances where you will, and people you may know who were pregnant and then they um, gave birth and they breastfed and then um, they got pregnant before even having their first period after giving birth. So again, unless you're wanting to have a child, uh, you know, right away after or soon after having um, the one that you may have just had, it's important to talk to your doctor about birth control and not rely on breastfeeding as a way to prevent pregnancy. So why the, while the US Department of Health and Human Services and other org, important organizations that um, support child development and play an important role in child health, uh, they recommend exclusively breastfeeding babies for the first six months and supplementing a diet with breast milk during the first two years. 
many moms aren't able to do this. And like I mentioned, there are a variety of reasons that moms struggle with this. And a big reason is because there are many workplaces that are not supportive. And sometimes healthcare providers are not supportive. So we need to think about, because we know the benefits of breastfeeding to both the mom and to the baby, we need to be advocates for moms. Ultimately, we're being advocates for family. We're being advocates for healthy development of the baby and the health of the mom. When we support mothers being able to um, provide for their baby in that way for as long as they would like to. So typically uh, in this country, babies are introduced to solid foods at around four to six months of age. And this can vary, can be a little bit later for some babies, depending upon the parents. And typically this starts with semi-solid foods like um, rice or oatmeal cereal. And it's important to introduce one new food at a time. And this allows for the parent to check for allergies. So they try one food with that baby and they see how the baby responds and give that, you know, a day or two, see how the baby's responding with that. And then within a couple of days, if there's, um, if there's an, some sort of allergic response, then the mother or father knows that it's due to that food. Whereas if the mother or father have been introducing several foods at a time and there was an allergic response, they wouldn't know which one of those foods was causing the allergy. So doing this one at a time is going to be very important. And finger foods are typically introduced by about 10 to 12 months of age. But when we're talking about introducing solid foods, it's, it's very important that parents work with their pediatrician and, they, and that they develop a plan with them. Many children around the world experience malnutrition. It occurs in undeveloped, underdeveloped, and developed countries. One type of malnutrition is marasmus. This is starvation due to a lack of calories and protein. Children who have marasmus lose fat and muscle until their bodies can't function. They also experience dehydration, chronic diarrhea, and stomach shrinkage. Children who live in rural areas where it's difficult to get food or in an area that has a food shortage are at an increased risk for developing marasmus. Kwashiorkor is the result of severe, severe malnutrition or a lack of protein. It's different from Erasmus, which again is that form of malnutrition that's due to a lack of calories. So proteins, as many of you know, are responsible for maintaining fluid balance in the body. Insufficient protein can cause the fluid to shift to areas of the body where it shouldn't be, and it accumulates in tissues. A fluid imbalance across the walls of capillaries, this can lead to fluid retention or edema. So the exact cause of this condition isn't clear, but many think it's associated with diets that are consisting primarily of maize, um, cassava, which we see in uh, various parts of the world, and rice. Also, it's thought that perhaps a lack of dietary antioxidants may also contribute to this. It usually occurs after a child stops breastfeeding and before they reach four years of age. And it may occur because the child's no longer getting the same nutrients and proteins from their diet. It's most common in areas where there's low food supplies and high rates of malnutrition. So it does tend to be most common in places like Southeast Asia, Central America, Congo, South Africa, and Uganda. But it's also, it can, it has happened here in the United States. However, it is rare. So it tends to occur in areas where there's a limited food supply or a lack of official guidance about nutrition. And it's more common in areas that experience low food security, maybe due to a natural disaster, drought, conflict, or uh, low economic activity. Sometimes um, children who have kwashiorkor, they, um, they will appear as though they are a typical weight or maybe even plump. But this, is, this appearance is deceptive because the swelling is due to fluid and not the presence of fat or muscle. So symptoms of this include a loss of appetite. Sometimes there may be a change in the color of the hair, dehydration, pitting edema or swelling, a lack of muscle and fat tissues, 
The child may be very tired and irritable, and there may be frequent skin infections or slow healing wounds. Overall, malnutrition is a significant problem worldwide. One in every 13 children in the world are experiencing malnutrition. Most of these children live in Asia and in Africa, but we know that there are children living here in the United States who suffer from malnutrition as well. It is caused primarily by severe food shortages, regional diets that might lack certain proteins and vitamins, and infectious diseases that inhibit appetite. The possible effects of malnutrition are numerous. So just a few are listed here. The most significant and devastating effect is death. In addition, children who experience malnutrition are at an increased risk of having lower IQ scores, of having behavioral and attention problems. And I wanna mention that early malnutrition has the worst effects. This is because we can think about brain development and how rapid brain development is happening in early life and how much brain development depends upon good nutrition. So what have you learned so far? Well, you've learned about the overall physical growth that's happening during infancy and the growth of the brain during this stage. You also learned about infant sleep and infant reflexes. You learned as well about gross and fine motor skills and the development of the senses in newborns. You learned about the habituation procedure and you learned about the benefits of breastfeeding and when to introduce more solid foods. You also learned about nutritional issues during this stage. So what are you going to be learning about next? Well, next you're going to be learning about cognitive development. You'll be learning about language development. You'll learn about memory and some other very interesting theories and concepts related to cognitive development. So I look forward to seeing you all online.